Okay, so we looked at uh, adaptation uh, impacts and modeling in the last chapter. Uh, here we'll look at a land biosphere and how uh, it can play a role in uh, uh, climate mitigation. Okay, in the other course I have on my channel called Bending the Curve, there's a chapter on enhancing uh, land carbon sink, which is very similar. I'm going to keep it close to this chapter since we are following the book and it's easier for you to uh, stick with this, but you can always follow up uh, m more details in a slightly different take in that book. Um, so human interactions with the land biosphere uh, obviously have contributed to climate change. We have seen that already. We'll look at again uh, how, what the emissions are. Uh, land biosphere obviously plays an important role in climate mitigation as well. Uh, we can do that through management of forests, uh, uh, management of agriculture, uh, other carbon sinks, uh, and shifting away from fossil fuels to renewable forms of bioenergy. So bioenergy is a land use type that obviously can contribute to uh, worsening climate change or amplifying uh, climate change directly and through feedbacks. Uh, the potential for mitigation has to be looked at. Uh, in the context of all the other demands for land use change. We will see that land, uh, especially land biosphere, offers many so-called ecosystem services. Uh, so if you want to do biofuels, for example, uh, how is it going to um, impact land use and uh, food security for some people. How is it going to affect uh, water use, uh, etc. has to be looked at. And ecosystem services that uh, well-functioning ecosystems provide to humanity have to be considered um, in terms of climate mitigation because we are causing climate change and we want to do climate mitigation by altering land use and once again the question is who's going to be impacted by that uh, plan for mitigation this also has to be kept in mind okay let's look a little bit at the la role of land biosphere in uh, just the carbon uptake. We have seen this already and we can uh, look at this a few more time because this is a critical figure just like the uh, killing curve of the Mauna Loa CO2 uh, increase. Um, this is looking at the uh, uh, fluxes, sources and sinks. So when it's negative here, it's a sink and when it's positive here, it's a source. Obviously fossil fuel uh, burning is a big source. So you can see it has increased since the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, this ends at 2017, but you can find the latest figure as well. Uh, the trend continues, obviously. Um, land use change has added a, a, a little bit of carbon as well. Deforestation, conversion to agriculture, urbanization, uh, etc. Ocean continues to take up uh, carbon and the question is whether it will continue to do that. And you can see that there are uh, more uncertainties as you go beyond about 1960 and it's also clear that the ocean has become a bigger source over time as atmospheric carbon dioxide has gone up. The same goes for land sink. Land continues to take up more uh, through carbon fertilization and uh, wetlands and uh, other forms of carbon uptake. And atmosphere, of course, is accumulating. And there are still some uh, uh, residuals in the calculations. These fossil fuel carbon is uh, easily trackable because fossil fuel is a, a uh, very uh, valuable commodity and very close uh, track is kept of its uh, uh, sales and use and we know how much CO2 that emits. There are more bigger uncertainties in land use so there is some imbalance that is uh, as you go back it's called uh, the missing sink often even though some people now argue that this is not a missing sink anymore, that land is in fact taking up excess uh, carbon. So the potential uh, can be split into sequestration potential and conservation potential. Uh, we will see this again uh, later on. So if the, the sequestration potential can be thought of as uh, going back to, let's say, the Industrial Revolution, we have done systematic deforestation till then, and there are good estimates of how much forest has been li uh, lost. So if 
we were to go back and recover all those forests, how much additional carbon would go into land? That's what would be called sequestration potential. That's what is called sequestration potential. And if we look at uh, what would happen if we removed all the remaining carbon, uh, the remaining forests, how much additional carbon would be emitted into uh, the system? Uh, that's what is called conservation potential because if we protect those carbon, those forests, that's how much carbon would be uh, sequestered. So it's kind of a simple uh, nomenclature, but you can also look at it in terms of terrestrial carbon management, where you have the conservation and sequestration potentials, but you also have a substitution potential where, uh, let's say, uh, you are using building construction and other forms of uh, use of uh, alternative forms of uh, construction material where wood can be uh, replaced for metal, for example. Uh, that would be the substitution potential for terrestrial carbon management. Simple nomenclatures, but uh, they can systematically be analyzed for their uh, total uh, mitigation potential. But of course, these are not independent of each other. When you want to do conservation, sequestration, or substitution, you are competing for land and water and other uh, resources. Quickly looking at global greenhouse gas emissions uh, by gas, you have the flue gases, nitrous oxide, methane, uh, CO2, uh, carbon dioxide from forestry and other land uses here, and fossil fuel and industrial processes, including uh, cement production, uh, is in here. So that's, uh, of course, uh, majority of it, 65%. Um, and this is greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector. So we have seen other forms of this before, where we looked at electricity and heat production, agriculture, forestry, and other land use, what is often uh, uh, ac used as an acronym AFOLU, buildings, heating, cooling, and so on, transportation, industry, and other energy uses. Um, so looking at this way, uh, there is the entire energy portfolio's uh, gas emissions uh, uh, coming out of the, uh, into the system. Uh, that energy goes into uh, industry, transportation, and in buildings, which can further be split into various categories. Uh, agriculture, forestry, and land use includes livestock and manure, uh, agricultural soils, recultivation, crop burning, deforestation, and so on. And you have landfills uh, as well, okay? So energy in agriculture and fishing is separated out here, and fugitive emissions from energy production itself. Um, so these are the things we will be looking at when we look for the potential in land biosphere uh, as a climate mitigation target. How much carbon can be additionally put into the system? So when you say mitigation, it's always additional carbon, right? There is a natural sink in the ocean, there's a natural sink in the biosphere, um, but when you say mitigation, it's additional carbon that has to go into the system. So quantifying that becomes critical, and we will see that it's not always easy, especially when these uh, land uh, use and um, biosphere uh, afforestation, reduced deforestation, and uh, so on are uh, used as uh, uh, promised additional carbon sinks. In that case, there is uh, monitoring, uh, verification, and reporting is needed for, to make sure that additional carbon is in fact being put in and uh, activities that would go on anyway are not reported as um, mitigation uh, activities or uh, additional sinks of carbon.